Well, good morning. How are we feeling this morning? Oh, come on. This is 1030 service. How are we feeling this morning? There we go. There we go. Well, my name is Parker Mathias. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I have the, prev- the privilege of pastoring our kids, youth, and small group teams. Um, today, though, we are starting a, a mini-series called Uncommon Generosity. And now I know that money can be a little bit of a taboo conversation, but fortunately for me, uh, God talks a lot about it in his words, so I don't have to do a whole lot of work. Uh, but let me go ahead and start the only way I know how, and that's through prayer. So why don't you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We ask that your presence would be here, that you would speak to us, God, uh, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to the word that you've prepared uh, for us, Lord. We just leave stress um, where it belongs, and that's in the past, Lord God, and we leave the anticipation for the coming week, God, where it needs to be, Lord, because you say today has enough um, stressors in itself. So God, we focus on you today, Lord. We love you, and we need you. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. Awesome. I would consider myself a very disciplined person. And I don't say that's a gloat. I just think God has designed my personality where it it just comes naturally for me. I have a tendency of viewing things um, as like black or white. I don't know if you can relate to that, but that's just kind of how God has has wired me. He's given me an ability to kind of live in the gray areas of life a little bit easier than I was able to in the past. But I think because of that, um, it's allowed me to see and view kind of things that I, as, as either right or wrong. You know, uh, as a kid, my parents want me to do this or they don't want me to do this. Not that that necessarily influenced my behaviors, but I knew it was wrong. It, you know, or that, hey, this is a financially responsible decision. This is a financially irresponsible decision. And I think because of that, up until this point of my life, I've stewarded my money well. Matter of fact, I'm very passionate about personal budgets. I don't know if you could believe that or not, but I just am. Um, I'm very passionate about young people investing in retirement as soon as possible. I'm very passionate about um, deciding whether uh, an expense is needed or not, or buying things I can afford as opposed to buying things I can't afford. And so in that, though, is, do you, is this a safe space for me to be honest? <laughs> I am very passionate about money and and saving and stewarding that well, but I've always struggled with giving, right? Because transactions, they feel safe. I give this, I get that, right? You need gas money, I give you $20 and you go to 7-Eleven and fill up your tank or put gas in your tank. You want me to buy you food, then you get to eat a delicious Chick-fil-A sandwich, okay? But God asks me to give my money to a a random person who maybe is homeless on the side of the street. Wait a minute, God. I don't know what they're going to do with my money. I can't, God, I just can't give them to them. I don't even know them. Or God asks us to give to his church. Okay, but God, what are you going to do with my money? I need to know. Now give me grace, guys, but these are real conversations in my prayer life with the Lord. And so, so out of that struggle, though, I've been studying and researching and praying about this topic for weeks now, and I feel like most of us have the wrong approach to this topic. You know, this idea of giving is not fabricated by the, the, the religious system so that they can pay the light bills. It's, it actually comes straight from the Lord. And we see that, the prophet Malachi, he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, quoting God directly. But I get it. Why do I have to give? Right? Why do you have to give? Is it just a Christian duty box we check off so that God loves us more? Or... Is there another answer? So through my prayer time, I came up with two questions that I wanted God to answer for me. And so I hope to answer these two questions for you today. Um, But before we get there, I just want you to know right off the bat, anytime God asks us to do something, he promises to do this. Paul says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power the desire, and the power to do what pleases him. So he's not inviting us to just follow rules. He's not inviting us to follow commandments. He's inviting us to follow the life that Jesus modeled for us. And so Paul says God actually replaces our sinful desires with his desire. So not only will you do it, but you'll want to do it. And he'll also give you the ability to go wherever he's asking you to go. Amen? 
So the two questions, somebody say two. Two Two questions are this. How should I give, right? How often, how much, and then why should I be generous? Why should I be generous? It's the whole point of the series, right? Uncommon generosity. It's not normal. It's not something we see every day and yet perfectly modeled for us by Jesus. I actually started following Jesus when I was 16. I got invited to uh, the youth uh, church here in this building, and we called our offering time, chuck it in the bucket, okay? So we actually had these metal trash cans that we would put at the front of the stage, um, and we would be invited to come forward and to chuck our offering into the bucket. And so I liked to dig into my pocket back when wallets carried coins and like pull out as many coins as possible and like chuck them in there. And I did it for two reasons. Okay, one— Honesty moment. I wanted people to see me. (laughs) Everyone else was participating. I wanted to participate too. And then two, it just sounded really cool to to hear the coins hit the metal trash can. And so so that's why that's why I give. And then after a while, I started giving a dollar every week. And then I started giving five dollars every week. And then at one point, I got a big boy job waiting tables at a restaurant making more money than any 19-year-old had a business making. And somebody asked me this question. They said, Hey, are you tithing? I thought, tithing? What the heck is that? It's a weird word. And it was that day, y'all, that I learned there's a difference between giving and tithing. Now, we see all kinds of offerings in the Old Testament, more than I honestly have enough time to go into detail about, but I can kind of sum all of them up for you. The the idea of these offerings and tithes were to go to directly um, aid the temple of God, and so they they were offerings brought into the temple in honor to glorify God, and they did a couple different things. Um, One of them was to support the priests who weren't allowed to work other jobs, and so they were sacrificing their lives for the spiritual well-being of others. Also, for well welfare-like programs that would go to aid widows and orphans um, in the poor, and then maybe what we would refer to today as taxes, money that helped govern the nation of Israel. Giving, and when we talk about giving, it's any monetary value given to God's church. But tithing, that word tithe in Hebrew um, actually means a tenth. It means a tenth. It's a unit of measurement. So if you're not giving 10%, then you're not tithing. And this actually occurs in the Bible often. Abram tithes. It says, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He tithed to a priest named Melchizedek um, to glorify God and all that he had done in the battles that they had just fought. And then later, Abram's grandson, Jacob, he dedicates his life to God, but he says it in this way. He says, and of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. And I love this because Jacob is acknowledging all things that I receive come from the Lord, and so I'll gladly return a tenth to you, God. Much later, much, much later in time, we see Moses, after he had freed the Israelites from um, Egyptian captivity and, you know, parting of the Red Sea is all of those things. Um, We see Moses, uh, God gives Moses the Levitical law. And so we, we see this concept of the tithe make its way into the law right here. It says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether from a grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. Why? Because it's holy. It's holy. And so now this law of equality has come in. No matter how much you make, no matter how little you make, 10% is what God asks for his house. And now, again, there's far more details than I have time to go into, but some historians believe that this concept of a tenth, a tithe, comes from this ancient um, civilization form of measurement, and that's called counting with my fingers. I don't know if you do. I still today count with my fingers. Um, And so when we guesstimate two, it's often in multiples of fives and tens. And it's not the first time that we would see God maybe redeem something in culture and give us a new perspective on it. And so this idea of a tithe is saying, hey, God, you've given me everything, and I'm going to give you a representation of that everything back, a tithe, a tenth. See, the tithe represented the whole Now here is where Christian thought diverges. There are some people that believe because of what Jesus did on the cross and even his own words saying, I have not come to abolish the law but fulfilled the law, we don't have to make certain sacrifices and offerings today. And we know this because I don't see anybody who brought in a lamb or a goat today. That would be weird. (laughs) Just in the corner. Uh, 
And you're like, what? <laughs> what kind of church is this? <laughs> See, but there are also some people who still believe the tithe is required in the New Testament. So it's a spectrum of, of beliefs. But what I do know, I want to share with you from the Apostle Paul. And he writes this to a church in Corinth. We get to read his letter. And it says this, Now concerning the collection, concerning the offering for the saints, as I directed to the churches of Galatia, so you also do, a.k.a. other churches are doing this, and I want you to do it as well. On the first day of every week, consistency, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, location, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come, and when I arrive, I will send those who you accredit accountability by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So God, Paul gives us consistency, he gives us a location, and he gives us uh, accountability. So Paul says, give as you prosper. I don't know about you. I prosper every two weeks in the form of a direct deposit. For you, it may be once a month. It may be twice a month. You may be doing contract work, and so it varies. Paul just says, give as you prosper. Now that word store, it's not referring to a bank account, and it's also not referring to under your mattress. (laughs) What Paul is saying, that that store refers to storehouse. It means his, God's house. And we know that because he says, hey, um, make sure I don't have to collect it when I arrive. He's he's, I'm not trying to go house to house to to gather this collection. We should be saving it up in God's house. And this is important. It's an important location. Because there are amazing things to give to in this world. Amazing organizations, even ones that, that I personally give to. But Paul is saying, hey, your church is your primary responsibility. See, look around. These people... They are your brothers and sisters. This is where you bring your offering. And then he says, hey, whom you accredit. He said, money's important. You need to have someone who watches over it. Here at Vineyard, we actually have a a, a board of non-paid individuals that approve um, salaries and approve the budget. So how we get to spend our money in whatever teams that we have. And so we have built-in accountability so that money just doesn't go missing or is misused. Because it's important to God. Now, I'd like to share with you, if I could, how I give. I've given in many different ways throughout um, my Christian life, I've, uh, all of the ways. But obviously, online, it's the way of the future. It's convenient. It's easy. But a couple years ago, I learned that every time I swiped my card at the info desk or I gave right on our website or I even used the offering envelopes and just put in my card number on those things, that the church was being charged 3%. And now, 3% isn't a lot for me, But when you add in a couple hundred people and you adjust for a range of incomes, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money that is not going to God's kingdom. And so I said, whoa, I want every single, my 16-year-old self, I want every single penny that I give to God's kingdom to go to God's kingdom. And so I give using quick give. It's so easy. I filled out a form once and I haven't touched it since. I sent an email to our bookkeeper saying, you know, change the amount to this. And that was it. And so I encourage you, give this a shot. You know, you can grab a form at the info desk on your way out, or you can find it right on our website, print it at your house, fill it out, and email it directly to the bookkeeper. It's so simple, and it's so easy, and the church has charged nothing. Now, everything I've set up to this point, it's important. It's useful information, even. But I don't know about you. It doesn't necessarily make me excited to give. For some of you, knowing that it's in the law, the Old Testament, is good enough. Hey, God bless you. (laughs) For most of us, though, we're missing something. We're missing something. We're missing a why. And so my second question today is, why should I be generous? Just why? We, We need that kind of a greater thing to look for, to work for. This why is actually essential. Because we've talked about the laws of God's commands, but we haven't talked about the attitudes that the, the people had when they brought offerings before the Lord. You see, God doesn't want to twist our arms into giving to him. Giving to him. He doesn't want to twist our arms into to loving him. Moses, a guy we talked about earlier, he was charged with building the tabernacle. 
And the tabernacle was kind of like a portable church. It was a tent that they would set up wherever they had like decided to, to rest for a while so that they could bring their offerings and sacrifices to God. And so this is, this is how it says that he brought this need to build this tent um, amongst the people. It says, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting. Later, it actually tells them that, they, that Moses had to tell them to stop giving because they gave too much. Imagine that. Imagine a collector being like, yo, you gave me too much, stop. <laughs> it's about a willing spirit. Not out of obligation, not out of duty, but desire. Right? It's a prayer that I prayed, hey God, give me a willing spirit. God, give me a stirred heart to invest in your kingdom. And then later we see King David, the same David that, that defeated Goliath. He comes before God and said, I don't want God to have a temporary location. I want to build a permanent temple in honor of my God. And this is how he um, uh, brings it before God's people. He says this, moreover, because I have set my affection my affection on the house of God, I have given to the house of my God over and above essentially all that was required of him. And where? From his own special treasure of silver and gold. Of silver and gold. And then he, he poses a question to the people. He says, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? Hey, who's willing to take part? David said, my affections have brought me to this place. Now let's see what happens when he does this. It says, in response to David's uh, willing spirit, then the leaders of the father's houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly. And then it actually goes on to repeat itself like twice. It says, they offered willingly again, because with a loyal heart, they offered willingly. It's about a willing spirit. And this willingness, this stirred heart, comes from the why. It comes from the why. The why is essential to life. I'm, I'm willing to bet so much on that, that if we lose our why, we're going to lose our way. When we don't have vision for a particular area of our life, we lose heart. And you know this. You've experienced it before. You've lost vision for your job. And you don't even want to go anymore, but at one point in time, you prayed for that job. You've lost your vision, your why for school. You used to be so excited to work for this degree, and now you're completely unsure of it because you've lost your why. You dread going home after work because you've lost your why for your marriage. You've got to remind yourself why you fell in love, why you chose that person, why God placed them in your life, and what he has done up until this point. The why is so essential. Even for your relationship with God, if we don't have vision for it or don't understand the why, we become spiritually dry. Here's the why. This is how the why affects us when it comes to giving. I don't have to give. I get to give. Giving becomes a privilege. It becomes an honor to invest in what God is doing, not out of duty or obligation, but because, oh my God, God you would choose me to invest in what you are doing? And so I have a couple things that I want to talk about why we should be generous, things that God had put on my heart and is continuing to work and cultivate inside of me. And the first one, it seems so simple, but it's essential because Jesus generously gave to us. And if you don't know this in your heart, we're going to start here. We're going to hang here for a couple minutes. Forget about giving. <laughs> Let's just talk about Jesus because this world, it's a mess. It's a mess. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> But get this, guys. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. The world's been a mess. We have a tendency to glorify the past, avoid the present, and dread the future. When God created mankind, humankind, in his word, he says, it is good. It is good. But when we break communion with God, when we step out of that relationship with him, sin enters our lives. And guys, it takes from us. 
bad things happen when we step outside of what God has for us. It just, it does. I was severely asthmatic growing up as a kid, and if I went too long without an inhaler or a breathing treatment, bad things happened. My great-grandma had to uh, walk with oxygen for a long, long time. If she didn't have that tank with her, bad things would happen. God is like a spiritual pacemaker in our hearts. It keeps us in line and in tune with what he's doing and what's ultimately best for our lives. But sin, guys, sin, it takes from you. It promises this um, false glory and this false need being met when it's only temporary. And you know this without even knowing it. Why? Jealousy takes from you. It takes mental energy. It, It makes you exhausted. It makes you live life in a way that you know is not you. Greed takes from you. It does. Lust, it takes from you. See, God saw us in this place. He saw us lost, unable to fully um, receive him and be with him. And so he said, hey, I love my people so much. I'm going to allow my son to leave his throne in heaven and come onto this earth and live this perfect life. This perfect life of loving the people that everyone else hates and, and, and ministering to those that have done horrible things and, and calling out those who, who place themselves on this pedestal and humbling us all while willingly walking to the cross. A death that most historians believe was one of the most gruesome in history. Suffocating on his own blood all while nailing my sin to that cross. Your sin to that cross. But not only there, defeating it by being resurrected on the third day, making a new way for us to not just be lost in our own desires, but like Paul said, allow the Holy Spirit to replace those with godly things, with godly power, so that we now can have direct access to our Father in heaven. Perfect love, willing spirit, so that when you go into your workplace and you hate that job, you can be joyful. When you go to school and it's a struggle for you and no one else in your family has ever been to college, you can do it because God has given you vision and where he is leading you, he will give you ability. That's why you can restore your marriage because of who God is and what Jesus did for us. But we have to, we have to remind ourselves of the why as Christians. For those of you who already claim to be Jesus followers, it's our job to remind ourselves of the why day in, and day out. Jesus, he gathered his disciples together, and he actually sends them out to do ministry. He says, hey, I've taught you these things. I want you to now go do it. Go pray for people. Go heal people. Go love on them. Go meet their needs. And at the end of that charge, Jesus says this. He says, freely you have received. Freely give. Freely, Jesus said, I have shared all these things from my Father in heaven. Freely go do the same. And I I read verses like this, and I think, God, what could I possibly have to give? You see my busted up Honda Accord, Lord? You see my townhouse that always got a problem that I got to fix? Lord, you know how much I make? What could I possibly give, Jesus? (laughs) A couple years ago, we um, sent one of my best friends to start a church in Richmond, Virginia. Some of you know him. Um, in his family, and he's still to this day one of my best friends. And the last weekend that he was here, um, him and his family came on stage and kind of shared uh, why God has called them to Richmond, and we took up an offering as a church to help support them in this, this life change as we sent him off. Um, and as the buckets were coming around, I remember thinking, oh Lord, I can't have people thinking I don't care about him, so I gotta put something in there, God. And so I like whipped out my wallet, and I found a $5 bill, and I was like, okay, cool. And I dropped it in the bucket, and then I went to pass the bucket on to the next person, and right when I let go of that bucket, a number popped in my head. And I was like, oof. Lord, that's a big number. (laughs) That's like a go to the bank and get a check type of number, God. I said, whoa, 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 God. (laughs) What is this? I said, God, for the past 10 years, Lord, I have loved on my friend. (laughs) I have prayed for him. I've watched his baby, Lord. I bought him food. We've watched movies together, God. I've recommended music, Lord Jesus. Is my friendship not enough? (laughs) Lord, is my friendship not enough? (laughs) 
And then in my heart, I kind of had this feeling that came up that said, you have more to offer than you think. You've stewarded your resources well, and now it's time to sow some seeds. Now, it took me a couple of days to go to the bank, I'll say. <laughs> but I went, I got that check, and I mailed it off to him as they had moved up there. And um, ah, it was so great to be obedient to the Lord, because get this, guys, every blessing that comes from that church is fruit of, of my labor. And now I don't say that to gloat, that's, that's scriptural. Every time you sow into God's kingdom, it doesn't matter if you directly prayed for someone or not, it's fruits of your labor. And so we need to be generous because of how generous Jesus was to us and because of this. We are the church. We are the church. You plus me are the church. This building and, and everyone who doesn't even attend the service, we are the church. This is just a building, guys. It's just a location. It's a rallying point for us to come together and to worship God and to grow together. But we are the church. When you leave this building and go into your car and go home, you're still the church. And so if we are the church, then we've been called to embody Jesus with our lives, to model the life that he lived. Paul says it this way. He says, now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you are a part of it. Each one of you, we are one body, so why am I generous? For you. I'm generous for you because of God, but I'm also generous for you because 12 years ago, and even before that, hundreds of people were generous um, in this building that created a budget that allowed for a youth ministry to be started that captured a guy like me. They didn't even know my name. I'm generous for you. I give for the needs of the church, for the needs of the people, and I give in anticipation for those needs as well. And because of faithful people, we have an awesome food pantry that ministers to people. We have a kids' ministry where, for some of you, that's the only hour and a half a piece you get a week. So, you're welcome. <laughs> We've designed an amazing program to love on your kids, but also to support you. <laughs> See, relationships are God's plan for the earth. I'm in relationship with God, but I'm also in relationship with you. That's why I give. For some reason, we hyper-focus our kids' relationships, but we neglect our own. It's so important for them to have the right friends, but it's also so important for you to have the right friends as well. Imagine, imagine if we saw each other as one body, and when cuts and scrapes come up, instead of chopping off the limb or the relationship, we work to mend those wounds. What if? That's why the enemy attacks and isolates us, because they're that important. Your marriage is important. Your family is important. Your church life is important. See, when I give, knowing it's for you, and knowing you give, and it's for me, it actually softens my heart to the needs of other people. It makes me more open to caring and more open to sacrificing whatever God has given me to aid somebody else. Because our fullest potentials are reached when we're planted together. Now, I happen to think that this is an amazing place to be planted, but I could be biased, okay? Give it a shot. Get rooted. And if this isn't the place for you, I've got five other amazing churches I can recommend. We are the church. But also... I believe in God's vision for the church. I really believe in it. Like, it, it motivates me to sow and to invest because, but I actually believe in it. Not just the global, like, Christian church, but, but this local church, I believe in what God is doing amongst all of us. Jesus was extremely generous. And if he refers to us as his body, that we are actually the physical temples of God, then we should also model his generosity. But we have to know God's vision for us. This right here, y'all, I can tell you, this is God's plan. His body mobilized. The local church mobilized. Paul actually says that a little better than me. He says, through followers of Jesus, like yourselves, gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. Christians in the church are responsible for so many amazing things around the world today. There's a lot of bad stuff we got to own up to. People are imperfect, and they've made some mistakes throughout history, and I do not avoid that. But the church, when obedient to the Lord, is powerful. 
Matter of fact, in 2017, a news station reported a study in Texas, and they actually said that um, of all of the hurricane relief that they get, 80% of it is from faith-based organizations, most of those being churches. 65% of hospitals built in impoverished areas around the world are built and or owned by Christians. It's through the church that faith-based ministries start, guys. I mean, through this church alone, because of generosity from so many people, we've started food pantry. We started outreach groups that minister to local neighborhoods. We have an angel treat program that helps families around Christmas time. We have started mission trips to Africa and into Mexico. We've planted churches in Mexico. We've um, had people get saved in this building and go on to be teachers in public schools. We steward God's vision here first. And again, I give to other places, but I take care of home first. Because if home's not taken care of, it doesn't matter if everything else is taken care of. One more reason we should be generous. Arguably, one of the, the mo- if you don't walk away with anything today but this, I want you to know this. And that's that one day we will all come face to face with Jesus. And I believe that his kingdom is here today, that it moves today, that God is active and, and Jesus is alive and speaks to us. But there will become a day where we get to face Jesus physically. Just look him directly in the eyes and talk to him. And for that, I want to remind you, there's more to this life than this life. There's more to this life than this life. And I'm not sure how you imagine that day to be. But for me, my, my imagination is it's like waking up from the perfect nap. <laughs> right? Like you are not exhausted at all. Uh, You wake up ready to continue on the rest of your day, right? There's no weird markings on your face because you didn't sleep too hard on one side, you know? You're just like fresh and ready to go. We just wake up from this nap into this waiting room, this like eternal heavenly waiting room. There's, it's amazing. It's beautiful. And there standing right before me is an angel holding a Starbucks cold brew and a Chick-fil-A meal. (laughs) It's my dream, not yours, okay? (laughs) Fries that never go cold in Jesus' name buffalo sauce on the side. Come on. And as I'm consuming the coffee and and eating the Chick-fil-A meal, my name gets called and I see Jesus walking down the hallway towards me. And I get so excited and I, I run up to him and ready to thank him and praise him for all that he's done and blessed me with in my life. And I'm just like, Jesus, thank you so much. And he just stops me. And he says, I've been waiting a long time to tell you something. I'm like, Jesus, what? What could you possibly have to tell me? I have so many things to tell you. <laughs> so many questions to ask. And he goes, oh. He looks at me, calms me down. And he says, good job. Yeah. Yeah. He says, I'm proud of you. I blessed you with so much. And you enjoyed it. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. But you also used it to bring as many people with you as, as you could to heaven with you. Good job, Parker. We actually get an illustration of this in the Bible. Jesus tells this parable, which is like kind of, kind of like a story, but the story has a meaning to it. Um, and he, he tells the story of a master who, who shares money with his servants. He empowers them to steward some finances. And, and he says, hey, I'm going away for a little bit, but I'm going to come back. And two of the servants, they steward it well. They actually double the money that God or the, the master had given them. But one servant, he takes it and he hides it. He, he, he buries it in the ground because he's afraid of losing it or afraid of messing up. And that when the master comes back, the master is going to be angry at him. And so he comes back and, and, and we get to actually see the words that the master shared um, to, to those people who stewarded the money well. And, and Jesus was using this as a representation of, of God when we steward our lives well and get to eternity. Jesus um, says the master looks at the people and says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. And get this, come and share your master's happiness. God tells us in his word that when we meet him again, when he comes back and and we meet him again, that he has rewards he's bringing with us. 
And that word reward in some verses is, in Greek is epodidomai, which can be translated as to pay us back. That makes no sense to me. God, you've given more than enough. What could you possibly have? For, what, could you, what reason could you need to pay me back? Guys, there's more to this life than this life. And I'll be honest, there are times where I want to give up too. Times where life is just beating me down and I'm over it. <laughs> but this this keeps me going. Because one day I want to hear these words. And I want you to hear those words too. So how should we give consistently as you prosper in God's house under accountability? How much tithe is a measurement tool, but ask God. The number may surprise you. Why should I be generous? Because you are the church. And if we are the body of Christ, then it's, it's in our DNA to be generous. We were created for it. We were perfectly designed in that way. Let's pray. Mm. Yes, Lord. Yes, God, we just ask that you would continue to make yourself known in this moment, Lord. We acknowledge that you've already been speaking, God, but we desire more of you. And so come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Every heart, God, every, every mind, Lord, every temple in this room, Lord, would you just fill us? God, I thank you for everything that you've been doing over the past couple minutes, God, and we just pray that that would be fully submitted to you, that it wouldn't be an emotional reaction, Lord, but it would be a heart change. God, a mind change, a life change, Lord, that we would just surrender those to you. So God, I just, I take a moment to lift up every financial situation in here, God. Those that are going well, Lord, and those of us that, that need a little extra help. God, I speak wisdom beyond our understanding, Lord, that resources would, would, would come our way, Father, not just physically, Lord, but just wisdom to set us up for a lifetime of freedom. Lord, I speak to those of us who have that wisdom, Lord, would it be shared? Would we do life with each other, God? Hmm, Lord, I just speak for debt to be reduced in your name, Lord. That payments that are unnecessary, that we could, that you would just make a way out of them, God. Yes, Lord, and I just, I want to take a moment for all of those people who, while I was talking, you see this Jesus but you don't know him personally, but you want to. You want to acknowledge and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as the Son of God for dying for our sins and being resurrected on the third day, giving us new life and direct access to our Father in heaven and, and a, uh, not only a life to model, but an ability to, to live that model. If that's you, if you would like to take a moment to surrender your life to the Lord, have him be first, I'm going to ask that every head would bow and every eye would be closed, not out of obligation, but it's just a respectful thing to do. And in a moment, I'm going to count to three and ask you to shoot your hand up, but I can promise you I will not make you come up front. I'm not going to switch the lights on you. I just want to know who I'm praying for. So if that's you, if you would like to give your life to the Lord right now, in this moment, one, two, three, raise your hand. See you. See you. You can lower your hands. I'd like for everyone to pray this prayer out loud with me. And again, not in a weird way. We just want to make it comfortable for those who just raised their hands to do that as well. So if you could, repeat after me. Everyone say, Heavenly Father, forgive my sins. Be first my Savior. Fill me with your Spirit so I can follow you. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name, everybody said a big amen. Can we give it up for everybody that just raised their hands? Come on. The Bible says that heaven throws a party over one soul that comes back to him, and I believe they have a raver going on right now. 
So if I could just take a moment and give you a couple next steps, that would be great. If you raised your hand while I was praying, I want you to fill out that Connect card in the program that you got. Um, put your name and then as much information as you feel comfortable, but check that box that said, hey, I, I gave my life to the Lord today. I promise we won't show up to your house. I'm not even gonna give you a phone call. I just wanna know who I'm praying for um, so we can call you by name and support you in whatever needs that you have. You can also put prayer requests on that. Um, so if you have one as well, but, but you are a, a believer, please write those in and then you can put them on that clear box on your way out or there will be a prayer team up front. They'll gladly take those for you. Um, as you receive prayer. Also, we believe that God has designed every single person with purpose. Amen? And we want to help you discover what that is. So please, if you haven't done growth track, today's your day. Don't worry about your kids. You get a whole nother 45 minutes without them. Leave them in kids ministry. We'll love on them. They'll get a whole nother snack. Don't worry about it. And then you can head um, into that, look at the banner in the hallway and head there for, for growth track step three. You can really start anywhere. Um, we will help you finish. Also, we like to give people an opportunity to partner with us in giving. And, and hey, like I said, this is not an obligation if you don't call this your home. But, but if you are a believer, I encourage you, be generous as God has, has been generous to us. And you can give in a couple ways. You can give by texting. Um, you can give by going right there on our website. Or you can do that option that I talked about earlier, quick give. There's a paper you can gather right now at the info desk. Or you can go on our website, vineyardchurch.com, and find it in the giving section. Download it, email it back to the bookkeeper, um, and we'll gladly set that up for you real fast. Um, that's, it's just so easy and simple. Um, if you're still writing, keep doing that. But if you're able to, would you go ahead and stand with me? Uh, we're going to end service with just one last song. Um, we've already sung it, actually, so you may know the words. And I love ending service with worship because it's an opportunity to take everything that God was just stirring up in my heart and say, all right, Lord, it's yours. Take it. Work in it, God, because I can't do it on my own. So I encourage you, sing out these lyrics. Lift up a hand if you've never done that before and just allow God to move into your life. Let me pray for us as we enter into this moment. So, Father, we thank you so much for who you are, Lord. Holy Spirit, just keep having your way. We know that on our own, we're not good enough, God, but with you, all things are possible, Lord. So we release our finances to you. We release our hearts to you, our minds to you, God. Just have your way inside of us. We love you so much and acknowledge that the absolute best comes from you, Jesus. So move in here today. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, everybody say what? All right, let's worship.